Well, in our house, you know, the uh, three amigos, you might say, are, are getting a little bit more active. And uh, Jude, our firstborn, Mike, our second, and Levi, our third, are, are beginning to, to play a little bit more together. They interact more with each other. And, and Jude has learned how to give instructions to people. Uh, and so... You know, he'll occasionally tell Micah, you know, do it this way, or, or no, you should do this, that, or the other. Uh, and, and Micah has learned uh, a little phrase. He'll occasionally look up at Hannah and he'll say, Mommy, he's not the boss of me, right? Um, and so that has been a small joy in our house for Micah to learn his own independence from his brother. Uh, you know, we've all had bosses at times in our lives, and sometimes uh, those are great bosses, people that we enjoy working for, people that, uh, that we love coming into work, and they've got something for us to do. We know that they're going to be uh, maybe positive. They're, they're going to lead us well. They're going to help us. Maybe they've cared about us personally well. Uh, I had a boss uh, at Baylor, I was a, uh, a resident assistant RA at Baylor. They call them CLs, community leaders. Um, and I had the opportunity to do that my sophomore year. And uh, my boss was really great, so great that I would often refer to her as a friend boss. Uh, there were two dormitories that she was in charge of, and every staff meeting was a joy to be at. And, uh, and we understood that she was the boss, that she was in charge, and that, and that she gave the directions. But at the same time, she, wa- she cared about us, and she wanted to know how we were doing, how our own uh, kind of college life was going, uh, how our relationship with the Lord was. And I was so thankful to have her as a boss. Uh, And uh, there were other bosses in my life that that were not always so great. Uh, So in high school, I worked at Kroger. I was a bag boy at the grocery store. And uh, I had to take the SAT one Saturday. And so I I asked for that Saturday off uh, because, you know, as a 17-year-old, there's no way I could take a three-hour test and then go bag groceries, right? Um, I was just lazy, okay? Okay. But, and so I asked for that Saturday off and, and they didn't give me Saturday off. And so I go to my boss and I say, I say, hey, look, I'm, I'm taking the SAT. I really, uh, I'm not gonna be able to be here at the time the shift starts and I really am not gonna wanna come in after. And she says, it's okay, all right, we'll, we'll take care of it. Don't worry about it. Just go take the SAT. Uh, well, I'll take the SAT and then, then I get home and they're calling me and they're saying, Ben, are you gonna come in? And I said, no, remember uh, I requested off. You didn't give it to me. And then I talked to you about not being here and you said, oh, it's okay. And, and my dad wanting me to be a good employee and wanting me to learn some work ethic, uh, says uh, he says, Ben, that's fine if you don't go into work, but I don't want you hanging out with your friends if you're not going to go into work. Uh, and I say, I say, okay, that's all right. I understand. And my, I think my dad was thinking that was going to compel me to go into work, um, but I didn't. And so later in the day, he comes back and he says, Ben, I really think that you need to go apologize to your boss for not coming into work. And so we, we get in the car and uh, we go to Kroger and and I get out of the car, and, and my boss is sitting on a bench outside of the store smoking. And, and so, and, uh, and I think that changed his mind about the view of my boss and what kind of boss they were, right? Um, that uh, he had seen maybe me as not a hard worker in that moment, but then he got to see my boss. Uh, and then there, were, there have been other moments in my life when I've had uh, bosses that are just full of negativity, right? Where everything seems to be wrong or the world seems to be going against them. And it's just really difficult uh, to work for people that constantly feed negativity. And I'm sure you've experienced a number of different bosses and supervisors in your own life. And you know that the best bosses, really great bosses, uh, they encourage you, they train you, they might sometimes challenge you, and they treat you like you're part of the team, that we're in this together, and we've got a mission that we're on. And and sometimes we have inner bosses, uh, bosses in our own hearts. And and the Bible calls some of these bosses idols, idols. Uh, Things that we pursue, that that we allow to direct our hearts, to direct our lives in particular ways that Scripture would not have us go, in ways that God did not create us to live. Uh, Maybe some of you have interacted with, or maybe even in your family have someone who's addicted to a substance of some sort, and you've seen that boss in their life, and you've seen it ruin parts of their life, maybe take things from them. And that's what bad bosses can do. And money, as we've talked about the past several weeks, can be a potent idol in our lives. And I would submit to you today that money is a very bad boss. 
And we've talked about several different texts. We began uh, the year with Abram, and we departed from his story a little bit. Uh, so uh, several weeks ago, we looked at Abram when he met Melchizedek. He had saved his, his nephew Lot from, from being captured by these evil kings. And then he meets this priest at, at Salem, Melchizedek, a priest of the God Most High. He's the first priest we see in the Bible. And Abram decides to give him 10% of his wealth. We talked about how that was the first tithe in the Bible. And not only that, but Abram refuses to receive goods from a different king who himself had been wicked. And so we talked about not is it just, it's not just about giving, it's also about receiving, but it's about recognizing God as the great giver. God most high, creator of heaven and earth, has given us every good gift that we have. And then we went on to talk about Malachi, this uh, somewhat famous text in Malachi 3, where Malachi says, uh, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse and you will be blessed. And we talked about in that text how God's not just the stock market where we put money in and hope to get money out later. But that money is a driver for our lives. When we give money to the Lord, to gospel endeavors, and we'll look at more texts in Proverbs today that point us to giving to gospel endeavors, uh, we steer our hearts hearts toward the Lord. And Malachi wasn't initially upset about the money. He was upset about injustice that the Israelites themselves were perpetrating against their neighbors. And so he says the solution is to give your money to the Lord and to begin steering your hearts toward God. And then we looked at Deuteronomy 17 and the most precious treasure that we all have, our time. And how in that text, Moses talked to Israel and he said, look, you're going you're gonna to want kings down the road. And you need to get a king that's an Israelite. And you need to tell that king not to just acquire stuff for himself. Not to acquire horses, not to acquire wealth. And even more than not acquiring, right, he needs to spend time in the word of God. He needs to write a personal copy for himself, so that he knows what scripture has, how God wants him to live, because he's going to be leading the Israelite people. And this week, we're going to look at Proverbs. If you would turn with me to Proverbs chapter 10. And I also remind you as you're turning there that uh, there are copies of Randy Alcorn's book, The Treasure Principle, because I don't just want you hearing from me. I want you to hear from other people. And we've talked about how this series of sermons talking about money are not fundraising sermons, right? And this is not an effort to raise money for the church. And I'm thankful that we are on good financial footing. Uh, but it is an effort to, to have you think about what am I doing with my finances? Am I giving to gospel endeavors? Am I serving the Lord with all of my heart, soul, mind, and strength, including what I do with my money? In preparation for this sermon, uh, I, I read through the whole book of Proverbs, and I looked for any reference uh, to money, uh, to gain, to riches, uh, because there are lots of different words that get used for those things. And there were at least 95 Proverbs uh, that covered money, wealth, riches, and they did that in a number of ways. Some of them were metaphors, uh, but some of them, like we'll see today, Addressed directly, thinking about money and what we ought to think about it. Uh, so Proverbs chapter 10, we're just going to look at verses 2 through 5. And that's going to uh, give us a little bit of a representative text for the rest of the Proverbs. Uh, let's begin with verses 2 and 3 in Proverbs chapter 10. Ill-gotten treasures have no lasting value, but righteousness delivers from death. The Lord does not let the righteous go hungry, but he thwarts the craving of the wicked. Uh, so this, uh, this phrase, ill-gotten, uh, sometimes translated wickedness. Uh, your Bible might have something else, but uh, this idea that it, that it wasn't attained from hard work or, or from uh, great business, uh, maybe it was stolen, maybe, maybe someone took advantage of their neighbor. Uh, that's what Malachi, that's what a lot of the prophet, prophets had to get on to Israel for, taking advantage of their neighbors. And this is what Proverbs is talking about here, gain that's received in a way that is not honoring to the Lord. And there are at least 17 Proverbs that have to do with this ill-gotten gain, a treasure that's gained in a way that is not honoring to God. 
in the New Testament speaks about dishonest gain as well. I shared with you a few weeks ago a scripture that I've been meditating on this year is 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 2 through 4. And in that passage, Peter is telling, he, he tells the elders, he says, shepherd the flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you are willing as God wants you to be. And then he goes on to say, not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve. Uh, Peter wants uh, those in charge of flocks, those in charge of churches, uh, to love the people, uh, to not be concerned with dishonest gain. And Paul talks to Timothy about this as well. And there are various other passages in the New Testament. Matthew, uh, Jesus tells the Pharisees, you know, you tithe your dill, your mint, and your cumin. You tithe all of these little things. You give 10% of everything you have to God, but you disregard justice uh, the weightier matters of the law. And he says, you can certainly tithe, you can give your money, but if it's not steering your heart towards God, then you're missing the point of that giving. And, and Abram showed us what it meant to, to give of himself and, and to receive well. And, and not receiving from the king of Sodom, he re refused to receive dishonest gain. And, and then it goes on to talk about righteousness and how righteousness delivers from death. And this reminds me, uh, there's a proverb that says, uh, you know, people with wealth believe that their wealth is like a strong wall that can protect them. And the implication is that wealth isn't as helpful as we sometimes think that it is. And now there are certainly proverbs that speak positively of wealth, and we'll look at a few of them here in a second. But scripture is clear that righteousness is far more important than wealth. And we've talked about how righteousness, this idea of being right with the world, living with the grain of the universe, various theologians have talked about it. And I'm sure you felt this before. We were talking about this in Sunday school this morning with the children. Maybe you've had a bad habit in your life and you've been trying to correct it. And in times when you don't fall into that bad habit, that you think to yourself, you know, my life feels so much better now that I didn't fall into that bad habit. And maybe, maybe you've struggled with anger at times and, and you were able to, uh, to be patient with someone. And then you were able to look back later and think, man, that was so much better. And maybe you had a, a small addiction in your own life that, that you were able to overcome. Maybe you've had a large addiction and that through help with professionals, maybe a rehab program, you were able to walk through it. And now you know that life is so much better. Righteousness delivers from death. Living with the grain of the universe delivers from death. And sometimes we pursue treasures, even ill-gotten ones, because we wrongly believe that those things will save us from death. And Jesus taught about this as well in the Sermon on the Mount. He said, don't worry about what you will eat, what you will drink, or what you will wear. And he goes on to say, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness in all of these things, what you will eat, what you will drink, what you will wear, these things will be added unto you. And that's what the Proverbs is saying here, that the Lord does not let the righteous go hungry. And he thwarts the craving of the wicked. Psalm chapter 112 verse 10 says, the longings of the wicked will come to nothing. So there's a, there's a clear opposition here between those who seek righteousness and those who seek to fill their stomachs, those who seek ill-gotten gain. And the writer of the Proverbs encourages us to seek righteousness, to seek, with, to, seek to live with the grain of the universe, uh, to live in a way that God created the world. Righteousness is a great boss. Uh, money is a bad boss. And let's go on to verses four and five. Lazy hands make for poverty, but diligent hands bring wealth. He who gathers crops in summer is a prudent son, but he who sleeps during harvest is a disgraceful son. And there are at least five other proverbs like this that tie poverty to not working, uh, to wealth with a good work ethic, and I intentionally chose Proverbs 10, 2 through 5 because of how these verses are all put together. 
So in verses two and three, we hear about ill-gotten gain. We hear about pursuing righteousness, how the Lord won't let the righteous go hungry. But at the same time, that's not opposed to having a good work ethic, to working hard. In fact, I would say pursuing righteousness provides a fruit of a good work ethic. Pursuing righteousness provides a fruit of a good work ethic. Uh, Paul says in Galatians that a fruit of the Spirit is self-control, the ability to control one's self. And wealth is a fitting byproduct of that hard work. So scripture doesn't say that having wealth is inherently evil. Having money is bad. No, that this is speaking positively of wealth. And it's important that we parse out what scripture says about it. That we know it's not evil to have money. It's, it's not bad to have a good work ethic. Uh, but ultimately, the thing that we're most ought to pursue is to live with the Lord. Uh, to live in right relationship with with him, to know who God is. The overwhelming message of scripture, the overwhelming message of Proverbs is not that we ought to earn money, but that we ought to get righteousness, that we ought to get wisdom. And I think it's right that we often as Christians speak about how we can do nothing to be saved ourselves. And I will continue to affirm that that you can't work your way into heaven, that you can't be good enough for God, those things are exactly right. And at the same time, we are invited to live our lives in the way that God intends for us to live them. Ephesians chapter two, verses eight through 10 says, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God not by works, so that no one can boast. So, so in verses eight and nine, Paul says very clearly, you have not saved yourself. You have not been good enough for God. It is the death of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross that saves you from your sin. And then he goes on in verse 10 to say, we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And Paul says similar things in Philippians. Uh, The book of James says, I will show you my faith by my works. The, the, The things that you do, living well, living rightly, are an outflow of your pursuit of the Lord. They are not a checklist that we check off so that we can give it to God when we get to heaven and say, look at what I did for you. But we can't win our salvation. God gives us our salvation through our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we are invited to to live out that salvation by sharing with others, by giving of ourselves. And in pursuing righteousness, we learn more and more what the grain of the universe is. And we experience the joy of the Lord as we live into that relationship with him. And I love these verses because I think sometimes people think of a Christian life or, or a spiritual life as, as one where you sit around and you hum spiritual truisms to yourself all day. And, and there may be days for that, days where you get away and you take time, you spend time uh, with the Lord. Later this week, I'm going to be able to go on a retreat and spend time with the Lord, get away from, from some noisiness. And I pray that it's refreshing that I come back and I'm ready to serve the Lord in new ways, to see what he has prepared for me. The works that he has set out, that he, he lets me step into, not to make him happy, but to experience the joy of being his creation, to take part in the things that he's doing already in this world. Adam and Eve, before the fall, before they eat from the fruit of the tree, are given instructions to fill the earth and to subdue it, to do work. God invites us into work, but it's important that we remember that our works are not what save us. Uh, Nicholas Herman was born in 1611, and uh, he served in the military in France 
And then he went to serve in a monastery. And he wasn't educated enough to be a priest, so he worked in the kitchen for most of his time. And Nicholas Herman learned a lot. That came to be known as Brother Lawrence. In 1691, Brother Lawrence died. And then in 1693, the vicar general to the Archbishop of Paris published writings, letters, and notes from conversations that he had had with Brother Lawrence. And you can still today purchase Practicing the Presence of God, which are reflections on Brother Lawrence's instructions as he worked in the kitchen. And he spent that time working and praying, spending time with the Lord, pursuing a relationship with Christ. He didn't do some, uh, some wonderful thing, and he certainly didn't have any great checklist to give to the Lord. But he experienced the righteousness of Christ in his working in the kitchen. Working diligently is a rightness in the world. It's what the Lord invites us into. There, there are lots of Proverbs that talk about working with the Lord. And there are lots of Proverbs that speak about ill-gotten gain, about uh, righteousness delivering us from death. And there are some Proverbs that uh, I categorized in thinking about money that uh, we won't be able to cover today. There are Proverbs that talked about debt, uh, most often about not securing somebody else's debt in case they don't pay it. Uh, there are Proverbs about saving money. Uh, the most Proverbs that had to do with, with wealth and money uh, compared wealth, financial resources to wisdom. And talked about how much greater wisdom is than rubies. How much greater wisdom is than silver or gold. And there are lots of proverbs about giving to gospel endeavors. Uh, Let me read for you some of them. Proverbs 3, 9 and 10 says, Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. 11, 24 through 26, one person gives freely yet gains even more. Another withholds unduly but comes to poverty. A generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. People curse the one who hoards grain, but they pray God's blessing on the one who is willing to sell. Proverbs 19, 17, whoever is kind to the poor lends to the Lord and he will reward them for what they have done. 21, 13, whoever shuts their ears to the cry of the poor will also cry out and not be answered. 22, 9, the generous will themselves be blessed for they share their food with the poor. 28, 27, those who give to the poor will lack nothing, but those who close their eyes to them receive many curses. And 29, 7, the righteous care about justice for the poor, but the wicked have no such concern. The constant refrain I hope you heard was care for the poor. And that is a clear gospel endeavor, uh, to care for the poor around us. And and interestingly, financial well-being is a fruit of caring for the poor. And there are probably many reasons we could dive into, maybe sociologists have uh, dove into uh, the fact that maybe we quit acquiring things for ourselves so that we can give more to other and we learn to live on less. I remember as a kid watching a, uh, churches occasionally would do like tithing testimonies, right? Uh, they would have a couple uh, come and, and talk about how they would give to the Lord and, and they, uh, then they would experience unforeseen financial blessing. Or maybe they would say something like, and the numbers just didn't add up. And I always, when I saw these videos as a kid, I would think to myself, maybe you're just bad at math. I don't know, like, um, why? You need to talk to an accountant. Uh, but... But in my own life, I've begun to experience similar things. I I wouldn't say that the numbers didn't add up, uh, but the Lord has been constantly present with my family. As we've we've been faithful in giving to him, faithful in in trying to discern uh, gospel opportunities to share with others. And I can say that these Proverbs have borne out in, in our life. And the instruction of Jesus to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And that all of these things would be added to you. And I've experienced the joy of that, of of wondering, you know, should we really give this to these people? Should we really give this much? And then later receiving affirmation in some way, that it really was worth it. 
That, that giving to the gospel endeavor is something that God used in a powerful way. And I've learned that, that money is not a very good boss, but righteousness is a great boss. Seeking righteousness sets, sets other things in order. We remember who the great giver is. We steer our hearts toward him, and we use our time to remember the Lord's way. The righteous way can be trusted because the most righteous one, the only perfectly righteous one, Jesus, experienced death so that we don't have to. He gave his own life for our sins, for our transgressions, the things that we did that, that broke our fellowship with God, the creator, God most high. And Jesus came and paid the penalty for that. And he did so after having lived a perfectly righteous life, having sinned zero times. And Jesus invites us into that life. In Matthew chapter 11, he, he tells us that to take his yoke upon ourselves, that his yoke is easy and his burden is light. And yoke for people of Jesus' day was really a way of life, a way of, uh, of guiding your life, principles to live by. And Jesus instructed the people that he taught to live by these principles, principles of righteousness. And people who maybe didn't believe him before, his own siblings decided to start following him after he died, was put in a tomb, and then rose again. And Jesus invites us into that as well. As I was thinking about that verse from Matthew where we're told to take his yoke upon us, I looked up on YouTube a guy yoking his ox. And I thought, I wonder if this will be on YouTube. And sure enough, it was. There's this guy uh, yoking his ox, talking about it. And his ox the whole time was just sitting there chewing grass or something. Couldn't be bothered. And I was like, man, I want to be like that ox, right? Uh, some of you are thinking, yeah, you're dumb as an ox already, Ben. But, um, but I just, man, I just, I was looking at that ox. And this guy's talking all about his equipment. And his ox just stands there, just doesn't even care. And at one point, this guy's behind him. And I'm like, you're going to get kicked by this very powerful ox. But the ox trusts this man who's, who's yoked him before, who, who's, who's felled trees by the power of this ox, who, who's moved around big logs with this ox, who's done a great work with the ox, all because the ox has trusted the man who's placed the yoke upon him. And I just thought, I want that. I want to trust the Lord wholeheartedly. I, I want to take his yoke on. And just to enjoy my life as I walk with him. It doesn't mean it'll be perfect all of the time. But I can imagine the days when, I, when I'm able to walk with the Lord, when I'm able to be attentive to what he's doing in my life. And I think about the crucifixion, the fact that he died for me. And the fact that I have hope of resurrection because he rose from the dead. And that is what I want to pursue. And the Lord Jesus. Money is a bad boss. Righteousness is a good boss. And Jesus is the only boss who chose to die for you. Great bosses encourage you, they train you, they challenge you, and they treat you like part of the team. And for some of us, we need to get rid of some other bosses. The Holy Spirit is working in your heart, and you, you know that there may be habits you need to change, uh, things that you need to do uh, to begin following after the Lord, to give your life to him. Let me tell you that uh, the application is relatively easy if you want Jesus as your boss. And just say, I need you, Jesus. And there you are, you're hired. The tryout is pretty straightforward. Just say, I need you, Jesus. And you're part of the team. You don't have to prove yourself. You don't have to go through a checklist. You don't have to be good enough for a certain period of time. Just recognize that you are in need of his goodness. A pastor of a church I served prior to coming here, actually, uh, one time talked about having to live in faith, specifically from a financial perspective. And, and so I emailed her and I said, hey, can you remind me of this story? 
uh, that time that you had to live by faith. I remember you mentioning it once and she replied and she said, I did live by faith for one year after I graduated from Bible college. The kids ministry professor invited me to teach some of her classes as an adjunct, but without pay. So I did. I did not have another job and Jesus took care of my needs that entire year, which was 1978. That was one of my most spiritually formative life experiences. The opportunity to trust, to fully rely on needs being met by the Lord Jesus Christ. It's one of the most spiritually formative life experiences that she ever had. Money is a bad boss. Righteousness is a good boss. And Jesus is the only boss who came to this earth from heaven, died voluntarily for you and rose again. But did you know that even before he died, he said, no longer do I call you servants, but I have called you friend. The Lord Jesus Christ loves you. Father God loves you. And he wants the best for you. Don't let money be the boss of you. Instead, let the one who died for you, who has called you friend, be the one that you pursue with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Would you pray with me? God, we give thanks to you that you love us. God, we thank you for financial blessings that you have given us. And God, I pray that the gifts that you have given us would not take the place of you, our giver. And God, I pray that we would remember your goodness in our lives. I pray that we would pursue righteousness, not to make you happy, but to know that that is how you created us. God, I thank you that the Lord Jesus Christ, your son, died for us. And I, I pray that we would uh, be reminded constantly of his grace, of the fact that he was without sin and he became sin for our sakes. God, I pray that if there's anybody here today who, who needs to say, I, I need Jesus. I've been, I've been living for something else. This other thing has been my boss. Uh, this idol, this thing in my life is something that I have pursued and I need to follow Jesus. I pray that they would make that profession today. God, we thank you. We thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.